Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Tom Ahern from Quantrix Software. Uh, very excited to be joining you this morning uh, for the first of our series in webcasts called uh, the Quantrix Planning for Good series. And our featured speaker for today is Matt Burrows from Lighthouse Foods. He's the VP of Finance and Accounting there. So uh, really looking forward to his presentation and uh, thanking you all for, for tuning in this morning. So today's agenda is a feature presentation by Matt Burrows. He's the VP of Finance and Accounting at Lighthouse Foods. Uh, he uh, will be followed by Brad Hopper, who's our new general manager. He'll be giving a, a brief Quantrix overview. And then uh, uh, we'll introduce the Planning for Good program by yours truly. And uh, we'll just give a brief description about that. And then uh, we'll have a question and answer session, which will be monitor, uh, moder moderated by Brendan Donahue, who is our marketing and sales associate here. Uh, after that, we'll wrap up and give you our contact information and any other uh, housekeeping items at that point. The length of our, our uh, webcast today should be 45 to 50 minutes, and uh, really looking forward to uh, uh, both hearing what Matt has to say and uh, your, your comments and, and questions as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Matt Burrows. Uh, Matt has... Uh, uh, been a, um, a Quantrix user for many years. He's the VP of, of Finance and Accounting at Lighthouse Foods. And besides managing the finance team at Lighthouse, uh, Matt finds time to hike, camp, hunt, and fish, while also remodeling his home. I don't know where he finds the energy. I can only hope that Quantrix allows to get, you know, gives him back some of his time so he can enjoy some of those uh, other finer parts of life. I also know he has a great team at Lighthouse, including Kim, Rich, Aaron, and Liam, who I think probably have uh, something to do with that when you say Matt. And yes, uh, sure. <laughs> it's great. So uh, they're a longtime innovator and customer of Quantrix, and uh, I'm really excited to to you know uh, listen to this this uh, presentation by Matt. I think you'll find it very compelling and and very interesting. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to say take it away, Matt, and change you to be the presenter. All right. Well, thanks, Tom. And um, yeah, just uh, great to um, kick this off and um, be able to tell everyone and kind of show everyone um, how we use Quantrix here at Lighthouse. Um, hopefully you can see my screen now and um, we can. see the presentation here. So, yeah, um, all good. So, um, just kind of wanted to to kick this off. You know, our um, motto this year uh, was "Write the Future." Um, we every year a marketing team comes up with a, a new motto, and so you know, as this year um, started in the first quarter, it was kind of business as normal, and um, then very quickly, you know, our uh, future or this year started to be kind of rewritten, and we had to. Um, adjust on the fly a little bit. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is how we use our current models um, to manage through um, our business challenges that we face this year. Um, Lighthouse Foods, for you, um, those of you who don't know, we manufacture um, refrigerated salad dressing. Um, we have freeze dried herbs. We have caramel. We have um, blue cheese and gorgonzola that we manufacture, apple cider, um, and just a wide variety of customers. Um, everything from um, a food service customer to a, uh, a retail customer um, like, you know, Safeway, Kroger, Albertsons, Publix, um, up into Canada, Loblaws, um, Sobeys, and then we also have our value added customers and, and channel of business, which are you know packaged salads, um, chop kits. So we do a lot of the unbranded, unlabeled pillows and cups and pouches that are used in the delis, um, you know, Costco, Sam Clubs, um, some private label. Um, what else? We do, you know, everything from industrial, you know, gallons and totes and drums of dressing. So just a wide variety of customers and products. Um, so we, 
we need a model that is basically able to um, help us uh, forecast and um, look at basically these four to five channels of business that all roll up into one umbrella under Lighthouse. Um, we're a little unique in the sense that we are not a public company. We are a private company. We are a um, employee-owned company. So we're 100% employee-owned. Uh, so that's a huge benefit to our 1,200 employee owner families uh, in the sense that it's a long-term retirement um, plan, essentially. And there's quite a few um, employee-owned companies out there in the U.S. There's probably around 6,000. So um, it's just a, a great um, opportunity to um, know that you are building value for your future, um, not for a stockholder, but you as essentially the stockholder and the owner. Um, so we uh, use Quantrix. We've used Quantrix for a number of years. Um, we have a number of modelers. Um, as Tom talked about, you know, we have probably a handful of um, if not more modelers who are using Quantrix on a, a daily, weekly basis. And we started off using it mainly in our finance uh, area, but then quickly uh, um, expanded that to other areas within the business. And we're still expanding it to areas where we just need to, to leverage the scalability and flexibility that the modeling offers. So um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more here. Um, so Lighthouse products, I, I touched on those a little bit. Uh, they're special to us because, you know, they're fresh products. Um, they are usually in the refrigerated produce section of your grocery store. That's where you're going to find our branded products. Uh, you've probably had some of our products if you've had a Fresh Express, um, you know, bag salad or Taylor Farms or a, you know, uh, veggie tray from Costco with a dip in the center. You know, a lot of that stuff is our products. Um, our employees are really what are um, special to Lighthouse. Um, you know, we have core values, stewardship, integrity, commitment to excellence, accountability. And, you know, we try to work those into our daily lives and our daily work here. Um, some of the community items that we uh, participated in during this crisis were, you know, additional food bank donations in terms of dollars, not just product. Um, computers for some of our Idaho students here as we're helping out there with our IT group. Uh, supporting local restaurants, we bought um, for two or three weeks, we bought a meal every single day for all of our um, employees that were working at the facilities. Um, and then we, you know, also helped and donated some bottles for a local uh, distillery that was making hand sanitizer. So um, community involvement is a huge um, deal for us. Um, and for us to be able to do that, we need you know, to make sure that we're financially viable now and into the future. Uh, those communities that we operate in are you know, Sandpoint, Idaho, Herc in Utah, Lowell, Michigan, and Danville, Virginia. Those are the four main manufacturing facilities that, that we have across the country. And then in, ensuring that our you know, food supply to um, the communities and our customers is um, there. You know, our on-time delivery and our fill rate is extremely important to us. You know, we've you know, operate around a 98.5% fill rate, if not higher, on orders. Um, and so during this time, we want to make sure that we're maintaining that and um, not letting that slip away. Um, you know, that's where we, we rely on our vendor partners as well, because they are very much, um, you know, under pressure during this time as we're getting supplies from everything from oil to you know, eggs to you know, spices and herbs from, from all over the, the country and world. So that's a, that's a big piece of some of the models that we've built to make sure that we have um, uh, future insight into what's coming um, in those channels of supply chain. So managing through this disruption, um, you know, our employee safety and our food supply continuity was you know, upmost uh, of importance um, in our 
um, prior strategic priorities for this year, you know, our employees and are kind of the foundation. Um, and I, you know, my personal belief is they're the biggest asset that we have as a company. They add the most value. Um, we come up with the, the best ideas. Um, and that's really seen through kind of our Quantrix modelers. Um, you know, we have a great uh, program here in Quantrix to be able to use, but it's only great if you have the great minds behind it building and having the vision of how to use it. And so that's really uh, what we try to focus on, you know, our employees safety. Uh, we've gone through everything from screening employees before they come in to work, um, segregating work areas, um, just, you know, having the right PPE, face masks, shields, uh, everything like that. So that was a huge, huge um, shift in our business. Uh, we were very quick though to get our um, plans in place. And so we were kind of um, on that leading edge of food manufacturers and com complying in all necessary areas, um, which really didn't cause, I'll say a major disruption to our business. Um, the only disruption to the business that we saw was the revenue and the mix changes happening as you know the economy was impacted mainly you know restaurants schools uh, delis um, and grocery stores to to uh, an extent so in our business we have a food service channel of business which is mainly restaurants and schools um, and so once those closed that food service business dropped uh, anywhere from 50 to, to 70%, depending on the product line. And we're starting to see a little bit of that come back as uh, different communities are opening back up. Fortunately for us, that's not the largest channel of business that we have here at Lighthouse. And some of that is, uh, I'll say, unprofitable or not as profitable business as, as other channels of business. So um, although we did see a revenue hit, um, there wasn't a huge uh, margin and uh, net income hit uh, to Lighthouse. However, that did have a big impact on our volume. So, you know, we had to be able to adjust quickly for schedules. Uh, we did furlough some people uh, three weeks ago. I want to say we furloughed around 200 people, um, but we've brought back uh, as of this week about 85% of those um, employees as our volume has kind of shifted back. So that had a big um, impact on our forecast, uh, had a big impact um, on our supply chain and the facilities. Um, the supply chain challenges, you know, the commodities market is extremely volatile during this time. And so, you know, we're looking at how much oil are we gonna buy now that goes into our product or eggs or milk because our volume just changed and the mix of the products just changed. So that has a big, impact um, on our purchasing group. So we've built a few models to try to forecast out that and see what that looks like. And then the facility impacts, just looking at what's going to happen um, at the facilities, what's their production um, volume going to be with the shift in the sales volume. Um, and we have a few different um, nuances there because our hurricane facility, for example, is 100% value added. So they make cups and pillows and that's it. So if our value added business decreased, they're gonna have a big impact. Whereas our Sandpoint and Lowell facilities, they kind of do everything and they're not gonna see as much of an, an impact. So here's kind of an, an overview of our systems and um, how um, Quantrix kind of works to, um, kind of be the hub of a lot of what we do. Um, you know, we have our, our ERP, uh, our main system, which is ROS uh, that we use. And, um, you know, we import uh, our actual financial data um, into our Quantrix model. You know, it goes and hits those tables. Um, so we can, you know, for our financial model, we can set the period at whatever we want and uh, bring in those actuals. And then, you know, if we're setting that at period four, it's gonna be, period four year to date, and then it's gonna forecast out uh, the next eight months. We also can bring in 
other items from you know our ERP or manufacturing uh, models um, such as production um, information, uh, bill of material information. And so we have Quantrix, you know, we have a main you know, forecasting Quantrix model that we use as well as some other uh, sub models. And those models are then basically used to push the um, calculated and compiled data directly out to Tableau or usually to a another like a data repository, data warehouse, and then um, Tableau is our visualization tool um, for the more complex um, views. So we utilize Tableau uh, quite a bit here at Lighthouse. Um, visualization in Quantrix, I'll say, is not, it's you know probably more just in a few of the models um, to give us a visualization before we push it out to um, the end user and consumer of the data uh, via Tableau. So um, we use, uh, you know, another a, a number of, of systems and um, scenarios of how to kind of make the data move between the models. Um, but for the most part, um, our models um, work really well together. Um, you know, and we we try to we try to create a, a flow. Um, the main the main piece of that flow being our our main financial model, you know, um, I want to have one forecast, not sales having a forecast and production having a forecast and finance having a forecast. And then, you know, you get very confused. So that this one, we work really hard to have one um, sales forecast. That's kind of the, um, the starting point of our forecast methodology. Uh, so Kim Olson, she works with our sales team she works with our scheduling group, um, Liam, for example, and you know they they go back and forth. She looks at historicals, which are kind of out the window in this business environment, um, and you know forecasts out the rest of the year and the following year. So we're pushing out a 24 month forecast every time um, she does an update. Uh, she does it at the product line level, which then ripples up to our channel business level and then it also pushes down to the SKU level uh, so we haven't always had that but Quantrix has allowed us the opportunity to be able to push our forecast down to the SKU level which is extremely important um, in in this environment and I'll talk a little bit more about that in here in a minute so from that um, you know finance model in the middle middle that allows us to then push that sales forecast out to operations models or manufacturing um, budget and forecast model um, to future demand models for like um, ingredient supply and then also our capacity models um, which are at each facility it has every single production line that we have and it tells us if we're under or over capacity utilization on a hypothetical basis so that we can see problems happening in the future um, that are, aren't happening currently, or we can validate current problems that are happening. Um, so this has allowed us to, to really be able to um, kind of have that closed loop um, forecasting ability, uh, which is extremely important. I don't ever want to kind of do a forecast, push it to model, and then, um, you know, export data into Excel and then, or, or Tableau or something else and, you know, try to like customize it after that. I want the complete start to, to finish um, model. And so we have, um, you know, we're not, I will say we probably haven't arrived completely, but we're pretty close and um, we have a very good process going to um, com continue to close some of these loops. Um, and, you know, we're working on data warehouse as well this year and getting more information um, from that, which will also help in, in some of this stuff. So that's been um, a big uh, push for us um, basically since the inception of our finance model. That was the first finance forecasting model was the first model that we built, gosh, I'm gonna say six years ago, maybe. Um, and I used to do our financial forecast in Excel with multiple tabs, and it was a bear to um, 
to reforecast. You know, you were checking formulas, and I mean, it it just was not not fun. And you know, I'm. I was, it wasn't my first uh, rodeo with doing that in Excel. Um, I've done that at other companies, um, but trying to forecast a complete income statement rolling into a balance sheet and cash flow is definitely difficult. Um, but Quantrix um, made that, you know, three week process. Um, I mean, we can reforecast in a day, you know, if we have the information, I mean, it can be a number of hours ultimately, you know, for Kim to go in and, and reforecast on our sales side and push that to our um, our main financial model is is extremely quick, you know, um, and that that's you know multiple versions, um, and then we can go in and analyze that all the way down to the product line and SKU level, which I never even dreamed of having that detail, you know, in the kind of the the old school way of doing um, financial forecasting. So here is um, just a, a screenshot. This is uh, pretty basic, um, but this is you know one of the uh, examples of our forecast and what we saw. You know, as we're going to use uh, food services as our example, that had the biggest decline in sales through this uh, COVID uh, situation. And so our gallon line, that's one of the the lines that we have out of our you know Lowell facility and our Sandpoint facility, we saw a pretty big decrease. And so you can see there on the left side, you know, we're chugging along um, fine. And then all of a sudden there in period four, we just tanked. Period three and period four, we just tanked. So then what the, the light green line is showing on the right is um, our forecast and that gallon line coming back to, you know, and I'll, I'll say 80% of what it was. And so we have um, the ability to go in here and look at these, you know, by um, package type that we have. So this is the gallon line. We can look at the units. Um, we can look at which warehouse. So we can go to all of those facilities that I talked about. Um, we can look at all four of those facilities. So this is just one example of what Kim's looking at in the sales forecast. And this is um, a volume and these are skewed numbers, but this is a volume uh, measurement right now. This is on units, but she's looking at this in terms of dollars for her forecast. And so this is a, um, I'll say a, sim a simple view. We have another view that's basically everything in tab Tableau that we push out um, and we can look at trends um, in various different ways. So this is, this is kind of the start of it. Um, uh, Kim works on the sales forecast. She pushes that out. Um, it goes to our main uh, financial model. We see what the dollars look like. We see what the trends look like on a, a gross margin level. And, you know, her model is, you know, ex extremely complex, pushing it down to the SKU level. You know, we have, I'll say, 1,600 SKUs. Um, so 1,600 finished good SKUs over a 24-month forecasting period by month. Um, by facility, so she takes that, pushes out through a make by transfer model, which then tells our facilities, hey, this, this uh, forecast that Kim just pushed out, where is that gonna be produced and how many units are gonna be produced? So then we take that manufacturing information and we also push it out to our ops um, capacity models. And this is a view that kind of shows two different scenarios um, so we're looking at a, a retail line here. And in this first scenario here, basically this is, I'm just gonna point to this bottom here, this line utilization rate. Um, this is basically saying that in, in periods five through 12, we're gonna be over utilized and over capacity. We're gonna be at you know an average here of, I'll say 105%. So that's kind of a watch out for us. And we've got these, conditional formats to kind of pull our eyes to these, you know, red numbers. Um, and then below here is, um, this is based off of a six day work week. So we have um, a lever here to, to look at different scenarios with the single forecast that Kim pushed out, six days versus five days. Um, and the, the way this helps us is we can see here very quickly that on a six day, you know, we'll be at around 80% capacity. There's a few days that are in the 90s. Um, but for the most part, 
um, this would allow our scheduling group to say, okay, you know what, I think we're gonna be fine. We'll schedule this forecast as it comes through because there's a lot of other variables that change. Um, but this really gives us insight. We do a full capacity review, I wanna say monthly or quarterly, um, where we take this information by a machine group or by a machine line, push it into a Tableau report and do, do an overall um, 12 month kind of forecast of what's our formulation capacity look like and what our, what's our production capacity look like to see if we you know, need to go and order a new um, pillow line or cup line or gallon line or retail line, whatever it might be, and what facility would we put that in? So this allows us to, uh, to go out and do that. So that's kind of one of the, the avenues and there's many models off of this op side that um, Liam uses and our cost accounting group and our ops finance group uses. So this is um, kind of our, our skewed um, financial information, but this is our, our main financial model and just a snapshot of that. Um, so as Kim pulls in, um, or if, as I pull in Kim's information into here, this is gonna feed our sales and then it's gonna feed all of our, um, you know, our allowance, our spends, um, you know, as we have coupons and other um, price reductions, um, if her model also feeds our cost of goods sold. Uh, and then we have this model set up, you know, I can toggle, um, this is on total company and I can toggle through every single channel of business. Um, so this is great, right? I don't have to go in and, you know, in Excel, I would have had to gone in and set up a formula for every single one of these cells and every tab and have it roll up to the front tab. And it's just a big pain, right? Well. This is extremely flexible and scalable. Um, you know, if we want to add another year, we basically just hit enter. Um, it's it's just an awesome tool in that respect. Um, we've also been able to come in here and have other inputs. So, you know, we're right now we're looking at our actuals and current year forecast. So, if I wanted to come in here and let's just say I wanted to change my purchase price variance. So this is Am I going out and buying oil at 25 cents a pound? And our standard in all, all of our bill of materials is at 30, 30 cents a pound. So I'm going to be favorable. I'll just say a million um, 300,000 for the for the rest of the year. So I can come over here and I can just say, do I want to include this? Yes. I put in the income statement line item that we have designated here. I put in my 1.3 million as a credit because I'm going to be favorable on my purchase price variance and it's supplemental. So that means that it's um, supplemental to uh, the base forecast that I already have in there. So this allows me some on the fly adjustability to the forecast because there's kind of a that art to forecasting. It's never like um, I'm taking the very first push from Kim's model and Okay, I'm done. I don't need to change it at all. I'm, I'm definitely reviewing this and spending more time on the analysis side versus worrying about, hey, are my formulas right? Is the input stuff right? Is everything rolling up? I do have a few you know, checks and balances, but for the most part, I'm not spending 80% of my time doing that. I'm looking at, does this make sense with how we're trending in our business? Um, is there anything, any assumptions that um, Kim is using or has told me about that does not look like it's coming through the financials. And, you know, how is this going to impact uh, my cash flow, my balance sheet? Um, so that, that was another uh, major um, change in, in using Quantrix, I would say, is it allowed me to, to do more of that analysis versus the, I'll, I'll call it a clerical, um, uh, formula um, work that I was having to do in my my super old school uh, Excel forecasting model. Um, you know, we never had this uh, ability to push from model to model to model um, like we do with Quantrix, and so that's just been a huge time saver. So um, part of the forecast that we kind of move next to is you know the cash flow impact. You know, cash. In this environment is king. Um, you know, a lot of companies are uh, are looking at that. So my income statement um, in the same model um, 
it basically feeds a balance sheet and uh, we have a, a formula that goes out and calculates you know additional cash that we're going to forecast or additional debt based on our balance sheet it's kind of a you know that balance sheet forecast um, plug to make to make it balance so here's kind of um, where we're at you know we're forecasting for period five in this scenario here to have additional cash of 2.3 million in these skewed numbers so um, you know we're kind of doing month-end close right now so we're going to go out and check and we would see if our 2.4 million dollar forecasted cash is somewhat accurate if it's not then we're going to look at okay what were the factors that impacted that and how do we adjust our model um, to to try to make it more accurate so that in these future months you can see here six through nine there's no cash so if i had scrolled down further in this balance sheet then in my debt section there'd be additional debt so that's you know my line of credit is now going to have to absorb that those cash needs um, from an operating cash flow standpoint so this is you know another piece of um, our forecast that we look at because the profitability piece is not you know the only thing that you want to focus on you also want to focus on um, the strength of your balance sheet especially some companies you know have um, I'll say more restrictive covenants with their banks, um, depending on how their their line of credit is calculated. You know, they might have collateral, they might be an asset-based lender. Um, so you can build your model around that and and really be able to forecast and get more detailed even than what we have here, um, down to you know the transactional type of level of where your cash outflow and inflow is. So another um a piece here that we have um, that is kind of getting into the non-financial world that we've built into our models is around um, capacity and purchasing. I mean, and this is this example here is mainly purchasing. We've already talked about capacity a little bit, um, but we, you know, historically didn't um, have anything to report out on for uh, purchase price variance. You know, in that scenario that I gave on uh, on oil. Um, and so what we did is we said, hey, let's let's look at our uh, forecasted sales volume. Let's push that through our bill of materials. So basically do a, a full lift of kind of what your um, your ERP system would do and calculate out the quantity of, you know, canola oil here that we use in some of our products. How many pounds of canola oil are we going to use in this scenario of week one through five? so that we know by facility how much we need to order and you know go out and buy basis for go out and lock in futures for um, because as our product mixes change you know some of our products don't even use canola oil so and some of them use more than others so if we see a spike in demand you know we're going to push that through our model and it's going to directly impact this and it's going to allow us to see out in the future further than our ERP system would, and it's going to do it a lot quicker. And our bill of materials that are set up, you know, are are updated to to bring in the uh, the values that are essentially used in production, um, just like our our system in Ross would do. So this this allows us to go out and make better purchasing decisions. You know, we have somebody who's solely focused on commodities. You know, their their whole job is basically to go out and look at the oil market, the egg market, milk, um, whatever it might be. And so they need that future insight because they're not maybe as connected to the sales team and the, you know, the product level, um, the recipe level that they need to be to know how to calculate, you know, how many pounds of oil or gallons of oil we're going to need. So this, this is a, um, a great way that we've been able to utilize that sales data to flow through to our purchasing, not only to the purchasing team and our um, commodity team, but also to forecast out our purchase price variance. You know, back to what I was showing you on their income statement. You know, before I would just look at the trend of our our uh, purchase price variance. Okay, it's you know unfavorable, 150k per month. I'm just going to forecast out 150k into the future. Well, as your business changes, there is, you know, a lot of 
of nuances there. So now we can push that through and say, pull in our last cost or pull in the average cost over the last 12 months for those items and calculate that purchase price variance. Or, hey, we're, you know, egg just went to $2 a, um, a gallon or whatever. And, you know, we're going to change that input to $2 and it's going to recalculate. So it allows us to to kind of do some on the fly forecasting to try to get a better and more accurate forecast. So kind of as I've been talking about, you know, for the benefits or for the modelers, um, that it is a lot quicker from the time that we have an idea come across or play or an ask that is uh, received through our, our FP&A team to implementation. You know, more than likely we have some of the data in another model already built so we can kind of take that and uh, roll it into kind of a customized one-time build or we just modify our current model if it's gonna be a long-term thing. Um, you know, we built, uh, we have an incentive program here at Lighthouse for our employee owners. Um, and this year we've, we've always had that in Excel, it's pretty complicated. And this year we're like, hey, let's put this into Quantrix and see how, see how it works, see if we can uh, make that work. So Rich uh, and our uh, Jamie, she, they worked together and created uh, a great incentive model. Uh, and then we were able to do scenarios in that in model. So I could go in and say, hey, if we gave everyone a 10% you know, pay reduction, what, what would that, or how would that impact our incentive? Or if our uh, NOI changed by 10%, um, what's that total cash outflow gonna be on the first quarter incentive that we're paying out? Uh, this allows us to do, you know, more scenarios. Um, you know, for example, we did three scenarios, um, kind of a high, medium, low scenario on our revenue forecast and our balance sheet uh, a month ago. And so, uh, essentially, you know, you can add a scenario extremely easy, or you can, you know, save a file and have or have three files for those three different scenarios. Um, there's multiple ways of doing that, but that was an I'll say a fairly easy lift for us to do. There was some some work to get that um, uh, coordinated and synced up, but for the most part, it was uh, extremely doable. Um, and then out of the box thinking, um, forecasting out like our plant demand and our personnel needs, right? So there's always there's always something out there that somebody needs. I was just talking to somebody yesterday, and they're like, "Hey, we need." you know, the number of people that are in our department. So every month we can kind of, I don't know, see, see what that looks like into the future. And we have all of our payroll data into a Quantrix model, all of our headcount data and benefits that rolls up into our budget. So we can go out there and very quickly get the number of employees or the employee names, the employee positions by department. Um, for the business, you know, this continues to allow uh, access to update information. Uh, we can pull in our financial information extremely quick. Uh, we can update that so we can have real-time communications with our customers, internal and external. Uh, it's easier to explain the rationale for our change plans and expected outcomes. You know, we do a, a good job of documenting our assumptions and it just provides a lot of consensus around um, and trust in the models. If everyone knows how the models are built and how they're working, then there's not a lot of um, doubt uh, around the models and like, yeah, I don't really believe this. So I'm not going to trust in it fully. Um, you kind of forego that and spend more of your time analyzing it and making real business decisions versus uh, questioning anything. So writing the future, um, you know, implementing cloud applications. Uh, we did that for our manufacturing model um, this last year during our budget season. Um, that's allowed, you know, multiple users of like our all of our plant controllers to basically be able to go in and um, use that one model for all the different facilities. Um, it's going to reduce our kind of the dreaded budget season drain um, as we uh, continue to push out some some cloud-based 
uh, models and some non-cloud based models and just uh, allow the users to go in and input the, their information or their budget directly into a rolling forecast um, to to kind of uh, reduce that once a year budget season uh, lift and that drain on on everyone so we're kind of right now in the progress of doing that and um, that's going to help us improve uh, and write a better future outcome. And it's going to show us in the future, hey, here's, here's something that we need to be aware of. You know, we just put in all these inputs. We don't like the output. And how do we go and adjust that to make it favorable to then come back and benefit all the employee owners here at Lighthouse and to get the buy-in um, from them and to um, you know, be uh, fiscally responsible for you know, this um, company that we have and that we own and uh, want to make sure is you know uh, very strong in the future regardless of whether it's COVID or whatever whatever other business changes are going to happen um, and so Quantrix has definitely helped us prepare for that this year and um, kind of opened our eyes to some areas where we need improvement in the future so Overall, it was an extremely good process. The last um, six years or however long we've been using Quantrix now kind of all blends together and especially during the last um, two months. That's great, Matt. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, it, it's an awesome story and I just love how you're employee owned. Uh, you do good works in the community. And I particularly love how you say you were able to reduce your forecast time down from weeks down to to, to hours. Um, so it yeah. it appears like you're you're still able to write the future and rebound even after the initial disruptions. And I, I applaud you and your team and your company uh, for doing that. So thank you uh, very much for for presenting today. Um, thank you. Oh, pleasure. Uh, so uh, the next thing we'll do is I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brad Hopper. Brad Hopper is a seasoned high tech executive. Uh, come over to us from uh, from Spotfire. He's also Spotfire. He's also a bon vivant, and we're welcoming him here as our new general manager. So, uh, take it away, uh, Brad. Thank you, Tom. Fantastic. Um, I think if you can make me the presenter, I'll share my screen. Excellent. Go. Hello, everyone. Um, I am going to give you a little bit of a demonstration of Quantrix. Matt and his story at Lighthouse is obviously the star of the show today, but um, so, and, and many of you attending the webcast are already Quantrix customers and users, and so you'll be familiar with the basics, but some of you may not. And so although Matt has showed you some incredible applications that illustrate the sophistication and that you can build into Quantrix models. I wanted to show you how easy it is to get started. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of things here um, by way of demo. And there's a few things also that I'm gonna tell you about but not show you. And hopefully you'll join us on a future webcast and get a bit more detail. So first of all, I just wanted to tell you that Quantrix, and maybe it's obvious by now, but Quantrix is a multi-dimensional modeling tool. It's not a spreadsheet. Matt mentioned a few times the kind of old school efforts in Excel. Excel and spreadsheets in general are fantastic tools, but they're not uh, expressly designed modeling tools. And that's what Quantrix is. And it's characterized by our high performance in-memory compute engine that does kind of vector math. I don't know if, that, if those words scare you, but basically the idea is that you can create matrices that are, uh, that's kind of the native uh, format for data in Quantrix and that the math that rides on top of those is extremely efficient and powerful. Now Quantrix has universal data connectivity. Matt talked about connecting to his ERP system, to his operational system, to his data warehouse, to his BI technology, and Quantrix fits into your existing environment in an extremely um, easy way. I'm not going to show you that today, but what I will show you is a bit of an introduction to the structure of a Quantrix model, how Quantrix helps you to create structure for your own models and capture your own ideas through this idea of a matrix, a category, an item, and a cell. 
We're also going to show you um, the efficient use of what we call natural language formulas. So that's writing formulas in a way that's super easy to create them and also super easy to understand them in the future if you want to troubleshoot or share your model with someone else. Always on pivoting. Um, it will, will illustrate that for you. Natively linked categories, I'll say more about that as we get in. Uh, parameterized assumptions and collaboration on the cloud. Now, one of my favorite features of Quantrix or capabilities of Quantrix is this idea of a one-click scenario. We're gonna save this favorite feature for a future webcast when we go into a little bit more detail. But for today, just gonna give you about a 10 minute demonstration and I'll switch over and do that now. So let me hide the PowerPoint and start in here with Quantrix. So hopefully you're still seeing my desktop there. Maybe Tom will jump in if you're not. This is the Quantrix modeler. And what I'm gonna do is open up a demo model. So this is really just uh, the, the simplest possible starting point for Quantrix here. So the objective for this demonstration, if, imagine that I'm a manufacturer. I've got a series of products that I make and I sell them across a series of regions. And what I want to do is build a forecast over time of those products in the different regions. So what we're going to do first is create a new category here and call it products. And that is going to hold a set of items up here. And we'll just type in, say, product one. And then if I hit the enter key repeatedly, Quantrix automatically will serialize those products for me and create what's called an item for each. And then maybe I'll hit return, enter one more time, and then put in a total. And then I also wanna track these over time. So what I'm gonna do here is type in, say, Q1, and then hit return, 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 and I'll get all four of my quarters for this year. And then maybe one more time and type in year to date. Now these quarters, I wanna hold them in a category called quarters. So I can type that in over on the right. So I've got the, the basic setup here, and it kind of looks like a spreadsheet, and that's by design. We want Quantrix to be familiar for folks who deal with data uh, on a day in and day out basis. But I'll show you in a couple of other ways it's similar to a spreadsheet, but I'll depart from that pretty quickly. So what we want to do is first just type in a few values for each product. Let's say the starting values, my, um, my, my sales is maybe 12, thousand units, 13, 24, 31, and just whatever numbers I wanna put in here. Now, what I'd like to do is have this cell here hold the total of my production for Q1. But rather than typing the formula into the cell directly, I'm gonna associate that formula with this item called total. I'll hit the equal sign on my keyboard and then say this is the sum of what? Of all five of these products hit return, and you can see indeed it makes that sum. So that's pretty straightforward. But notice here, I've got these little zeros showing up in my other columns. The reason for that is because this computation is occurring across all slices, all quarters in my matrix right now already. I didn't have to copy that formula across. It's automatically associated with that, which you might call dimension of the matrix. Now let's do a similar thing with year to date. I can click on this hit the equal sign, and then type sum. Now notice that I've got an autocomplete capability here, a whole series of different um, functions that start with the, the letters S-U-M. Also over on the left, I have a functions table here where I have hundreds of different functions that I could pull from if I like. Uh, but right now we'll just stick with the basics. So I'll choose sum. And then again, I'll just merely select my quarters, hit return and now I have the sum running across. Now, notice that, or maybe if, you, if you're paying attention, you'll see that I made this calculation, and you can see the dark blue here indicating that it's summing down my matrix, and I've got a little bit of a hashing going on here. Why? Because this formula overlaps with the second formula that I made. In Quantrix terminology, that's called being eclipsed. So this first formula is being overridden, eclipsed by the second formula. So what I might do is go in here and tell this formula to skip the year, uh, sorry, skip the total. And now um, you'll see that when I click on this, it's only summarizing from right to left, excluding the total. Now, what we'd like to do is fill in these cells here with our predictions. So what we'll do now is create a new formula 
And this formula, actually, what we'd like to have happen is that the, the value for this quarter is dependent upon the previous quarter. Let's say we want to have some kind of growth rate put into the application. So what we can do is click in this formula and again, choose the quarter. And then what do we want to say is this quarter, whichever quarter, you know, the cell in which we're talking about is equal to the quarter. And again, I can use autocomplete to select any items or categories from my matrix, quarters previous, and then maybe we'll just multiply that by two. So now you can see immediately up above 12 times two is 24, 13 times two is 26 and so on. Now, again, one more thing, we don't want the totals to be doubling. We want the totals to actually continue to use this uh, total formula. So what we can do is add some skips. Now, Quantrix is smart enough to know where those formulas overlap or eclipse one another. So we can, rather than typing that in, we can simply right click and say, inserts all the appropriate skips. Now we can see this formula covers that bottom row, the total row. This formula just covers the far right in the year-to-date column. And then finally, this formula covers all of the cells in the middle. Pretty cool. Now, one thing that where we start to depart from a, a spreadsheet-based approach is that I might want to add a new product now. So all I have to do is go in and click on this item and hit return, and then perhaps enter in a new starting value, 20, hit return and I'm done. So instead of having to go and make space in my spreadsheet, copy and paste all three of those formulas across all the different cells, all I have to do is hit return and type in a single number and I'm done. Um, similarly, if I wanna go ahead and add regions, as we said, set up in the scenario there, I can click on this category, hit enter, type in region, maybe regions, hit return, and you'll see that now a new dimension has been added to the matrix here, and the values have yet to be defined. I'll do that in a second. But let's talk about pivoting. I might want to move the regions over to the left so that I view those as a kind of higher order part of the hierarchy. I can click on this region, type in north, maybe hit return again, and say south, and again east, and now I've created three different regions and I've expanded my matrix with this dimension. And you can see I've got now almost 100 formulas, maybe a little more than 100 formulas now have been entered for me automatically. No cutting and pasting, no scrolling across and so on. So let's do this. Let's copy these values from my north region and just simply paste them into the south and the east to make things quick. I could type in some values or more realistically, I would connect to my database to get the existing production and then uh, con concatenate that with my ongoing um, in the future forecasts. But for now, let's just paste those values in. And so what we'd like to do is forecast this out, but times two is pretty simplistic. Although I might love to double my forecast every quarter, let's do something a little bit more realistic. So to do so, I've got a new matrix here called assumptions, and it's pretty much empty at this time. I just wanna drag it to the front so we can so we can see it more easily. And what I wanna put in here is a percentage rate increase. And I wanna do that for each of the regions in my matrix. Now I might go in and add an individual item and then type in those values for those items like you might do in a traditional spreadsheet kind of approach. But the problem then would be the relationship between those regions would not be assured. So I might have an extra region in my rate sheet or an extra region here that's missing a value. So one thing that Quantrix can offer is this always linked shared categories. So if I take the region category from this matrix and drag it over here, Notice that it automatically populates each of the three regions that I had in my home matrix. Now I can say, type in a couple of rates, 110%, 115%, 105%, return. And now all I have to do to use these rates is to go back to this formula and say, uh, highlight this number two. And instead of that number, we just click on rates. So you'll see the notation here is the assumptions matrix using the rates variable, and then it will automatically associate those to all of the different categories in my matrix. Now I might wanna format that with a few, uh, a little bit fewer decimal points, make it a little bit easier to read. So there we go. We've created this forecast. 
um, across all of our different regions using these different rates. Now, as, <clears throat> as Matt mentioned, um, we, we get so much agility with Quantrix. What if we want to add a new region? All we need to do is click on this region, hit enter, and now maybe we'll type in west. Yep. We'll type in west, add a few more values, hit return. Now notice that Quantrix automatically put a placeholder for me for the rate for the West region that I just created. If I put in 111% and return, we're done. So this concept of linking these categories is unbelievably powerful. There's no V lookups, there's no cutting and pasting. It, you're just good to go with a couple, of, a couple of clicks. Now, the last thing I wanna show you before we move back and conclude with a Q&A is that I might wanna share this information with my colleagues, perhaps with each of the regional managers for them to put in their own growth, expected growth rate. And I might wanna do it in the cloud. So I'm gonna publish this application to the cloud log in there and I'll call this um, newest model and hit finish. And here is a link to that model. I'll just go over to my browser, which is here. I'm already logged into Quantrix Cloud. Hopefully it won't ask me to log in again. I'll hit, I'll paste that link. And then we can see the same model is available to us here on the cloud. I don't need any installation. And as a regional manager for the East, I might say, hey, I don't like this 105%, I'm gonna get a, a bit more aggressive and have 115% rate. And that then applies itself to the, to the sum total and everybody who's synchronized with this model will get that most recent update. So with that, I'll close on this demo and we'll move to the next phase, which I think is the Q&A. Or no, actually, Tom, are you gonna talk a little bit about our Planning for Good program? Absolutely, so thank you. Uh, for that demonstration, Brad, uh, very insightful and, and, and very succinct. Thank you very much. So let me just get back to my screen and tell me if you can see uh, the planning for good. So um, I pity the poor person who had to follow those first two um, uh, present, presenters. Oh, it's, it's me. But anyway, I just wanted to describe briefly our planning for good series. It's really exciting and, and uh, hope that you enjoy what you're about to see. So planning for good, what do we mean by this? There's three basic facets to our planning for good series. Um, if you're looking at, this is the, the webpage on, on Quantrix.com under planning for good. So for everyone, new customers uh, and, and, and existing clients, we are allowing you to get a no charge license. Uh, all we need you to do is fill out the form and this license gives you a good long time to use it up until August 31st of 2020. So uh, there are some limits, uh, you know, we want to limit it to the first 200 companies, but uh, you know, please take advantage of this program if you're, if you're new to Quantrix and really want to find out the power it can bring to your organization like it does to organizations like Lighthouse. Hey, just a quick it's correction there. You, uh, it's October 31st. It's Halloween, Tom. I think you said August. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. I was scared by the Halloween, obviously. Thank you, Brad. Uh, also, uh, like today, we're having this uh, Planning for Good webinar. Our next one is uh, going to be in late June, and I'm really excited about that webinar as well because it'll feature Jason Klinghoffer from Michler Financial, a, uh, a uh, midsize investment bank who's doing some very cool things with Quantrix. So uh, be sure to sign up for that uh, webinar. You'll see it posted here very shortly on this web page. And then for our loyal and existing customers, um, real loved, love you guys and wanna make sure that uh, during this, this pandemic that you're able to work from home. So we've immediately instituted what we call our work from home activation. Uh, all our current customers, uh, you know, get uh, with, under maintenance, get to, have an additional an additional activation of Quantrix for their home uh, laptop or computer. So uh, during this time, it was our, our way to see if we could help our, our customer base get that additional activation. So um, those are the ways we're trying to you know help our models get involved with planning for good. I really urge you to to come up and uh, to our website and register for these programs as appropriate. Let's move into our question and answer session. I think it uh, seems like there's a lot of questions. I know we're hard up on the hour here, but let's see if we can fit in two or three of these questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brendan 
And uh, if you could posit the first question to the panelists here. Sounds good. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I just uh, I just want to say thank you again to everybody um, for for attending, and also uh, Matt for um, sharing your story and your experience and uh, knowledge with us. I think that was really great to see. Um, so there's there's a there's definitely a few questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to do my best to to try to get to these. Um, if your question is not answered, however, during this time, look out for an email from us, and we'll try to get you that answer as quickly as possible. Uh, so um, Matt, I'll I guess I'll start with you. There's a there's a couple here, um, and so I want to say once again, I, I really like the presentation, and thank you for sharing that. And I I think that. It was great to see not only the um, work that Lighthouse is doing in terms of the food supply, but also in terms of all the community work. And so could you please comment on some of the changes that might need to be made in the operations as um, general business starts to open um, across the US and I guess across the world? Yeah, so for for us, you know, it's mainly going to be um, focusing on our customers and um, how their business is going to change that will kind of ripple through our business, you know. So for one of the examples is delis, you know, a lot of the delis have been closed down in you know, grocery stores. And so there are um, a large base of our customers, you know, um, we we provide pouches. Um, you know, uh, for behind the glass deli kits that are made uh, in the stores or at, at processing centers. So um, those deli programs, you know, they might have had 30 SKUs. I think we're going to see a big consolidation of those SKUs to maybe, you know, six SKUs or six um, deli program um, offerings versus the number that we had before, um, which is potentially a good thing that's going to allow some um longer production runs for those you know reduced number of SKUs because hopefully the volume of those SKUs will um get back to you know 80 percent of what they used to be uh so that's one way that we're trying to um see how it's how this COVID is going to impact our customers and the consumers it's gonna it's going to change the way consumers shop in a grocery store to a retail store um you know there's going to be a lot more online so that's something also that we've been looking at is how to um, fulfill orders online and a lot of our products refrigerated so um it's hard to ship refrigerated product or costly um so that's kind of what we have our eye on um, for the manufacturing side and um just knowing that this is going to change consumers uh, we have to be agile and and able to change with them and grow with our customers uh, who are providing that product to the consumer great thank you um and i there's another question that came in that uh, i think is a little bit tied into that um which is with all that's going on, uh, it, to what extent do you use macroeconomic drivers to to forecast? Are there any things that you look at with certain prices or inflation or anything that's going on, you know, across the globe that may impact some of your forecasts? Yes, for sure. Um, you know, there's a big part of our business is up in Canada, um, and so you know the Canadian exchange rate to the U.S. dollar, which is our functional currency. Is something that I'm looking at on a daily basis, right? So our sales into Canada um, are in CAD, and we had we have to convert those to USD. And so I'm looking at that exchange rate and um, implementing that into our sales forecast. So for Canada, you know, we're forecasting in unit growth, and then we're having to convert that back into USD um, from our uh, Canadian. Uh, sales sheet essentially so um, and during this COVID time you know the the Canadian exchange rate was uh, 1.3 on average for last year that's what our budget was that's what our forecast was then it went to 1.4 um, and so that had a, a decreasing um, impact on our top line sales 
um, but the volume basically, let's just say, stayed the same. So then we have to reforecast that. We have to look at our allowance spend to those reduced sales. And so that's just one way um, that we look at that macro environment. We look at it on our commodities too. That's a huge thing that we look at on a, a daily basis. We have one person that's solely focused on our commodities purchasing and our, our forecasting. And we use hedging instruments on both the, the FX side and the commodity side. Right, that makes sense. That that's that's really helpful. Um, and so I guess one of the only other questions is that I think you've already touched on um, is what did you use before Quantrix? And I think you mentioned Excel uh, at some point during your presentation. Um, but you know, maybe if you could speak just a second on um, what did you use and how did you find the process of ramping up um, on that on on using that technology and switching over to Quantrix. Yeah, so we used Excel and I, you know, I had created a, a multi-tab, you know, Excel file basically that um, had our channels of business that rolled up to a total company. And, you know, um, as Brad just showed here, you know, being able to kind of go in and hit enter and all those formulas carrying over and not having to go and recheck all those formulas and spend all the time. I mean, that's that's what I was doing. I was spending 80% of my time you know, checking and validating, you know, I've got an error here. And I mean, to be honest, um, and, uh, you know, we might have one or two, you know, errors or something that's not calculating right um, every month um, in Quantrix, maybe every other month, I'll just say, but it's mainly, um, you know, it's mainly just the complexity of the model and trying for us to remember, oh yeah, that's how we, that's why we did this. And so, um, what what we did when we first implemented Quantrix, we just said, you know what, we're going to take the the biggest um, kind of Excel model that we have, the biggest driver of our business, and we're just going to tackle it. We're going to that's how we're going to learn Quantrix, and we used a consulting group to come in and help us um, kind of guide us through that, and then we just took it from there and just kind of continued to to expand that base, and that's that's essentially. Um, the base model that we have that we do all so we built our full budget um budgeting program and software essentially into quantrix as well as our forecast so it's a it's an all-in-one tool now so we used to use a uh, microsoft forecaster i think was our budgeting tool you know 10 years ago um that went unsupported and so we just said we're not going to go out and buy another forecasting system we're going to build our own budget and forecasting system using Quantrix. And then it's allowed us a ton more flexibility and other avenues to um, bridge off of that versus a kind of out of the box um, system. Great, well, th thank you again, Matt. Um, I really appreciate you answering the questions. Um, and we just have one more, and that's actually gonna be directed to Tom. Um, and so just for uh, going back to the planning for good for a second, if you're already a Quantrix customer, um, can you say again if my company is eligible for the free license? Uh, yes, um, absolutely. So uh, this, this program does apply to our existing and loyal client base. So yes, you can get a, a free license for use in addition to the additional activations that will give you under the work from home employee. So hopefully that, that that license you can you know place in a new department or some other area of the business that could benefit from Quantrix, um, and and also just want to make sure that you know, and if you're not a current customer and you you know need to see more or you see the need for more than one license at your company, to, you know just reach out to us and 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 we'll work something out. Yeah, thank you. All right, well that wraps it up for the uh, the questions, and I'll hand it back over to you, Tom, and I think for the um, the finishing touches here. All right, great. Well, uh, I guess that all that's left to say is thank you to to you, uh, our guests who have uh, tuned into this webinar, and also to our presenters, uh, Brad and uh, and Matt. So thank you all very much for for attending, and especially for those who submitted questions. If we didn't get to your questions, like uh, Brendan said, we'll we'll get back to you as soon as possible with those answers. Um, you can find out uh, more about our Planning for Good program right at our website. Uh, the uh, the the link that you see on the screen there. Uh, we'll have our next webinar. We'll be featuring Jason Klinghoffer from Michler Financial. 
in late June. Stay tuned, we'll, we'll get you more information about that. If you need to reach out to us about questions or comments, anything like that, just reach out to us at customer service at Quantrix.com. So just wanna say, take charge of your organization's with, uh, future with Quantrix. Thank you all very much for attending. And I look forward to seeing you on your next uh, uh, webinar. Thank you.